He, said, he didn't say that a sunnah means to uh, say that Abu Bakr is most adjoined of the Khilafah than Umar than Uthman than Ali and to believe in Qajar and to read the Quran is uncreated but the literal spoken word of Allah SWT. He said it means to know what you have placed in your belly. Is it halal or haram? Meaning in the sense that obviously if somebody is going to apply the sunnah to that degree that he is so careful to make sure that he only ingests that which is halal by he should be more careful to make sure that that which enters into his heart is only true and not falsehood. So this was just the way of him. But the point is it shows us that the sunnah, when we say al Jama'ah, doesn't just mean belief. Although belief is the foundation, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, is this definition clear, inshallah? Huh? They have gathered upon the sunnah not dividing into sects, factions, groups. Okay. Uh, the Arabic origination? No, the Arabic origination. Ahlusun wa Well, this is found in some of the uh, statements of uh, Ibn Abbas. He says, Ahlusun wa al uh, which you can find in uh, the tafsir of Surah Al Imran, the verses of Al Imran, in Ibn Kathir's tafsir. Now, whether this statement is, which has been attributed to Ibn Abbas, whether the chain of narrators reaching him is authentic or not, this is another question. But definitely, you know that Ibn Sirin, who was one of the Tabi'een, uh, as Imam Muslim mentions in his Muqaddimah, in his introduction to his work, he says, uh, talking about the, uh, the origin of the Senate, uh, talking about the, uh, the origin of the Senate, of the chain of narrators, he says that prior to the fitna, we would not ask for a person concerning, you know, where did you get this hadith from? But when the fitna occurred, and when the division between the Muslims occurred, we started to ask, those are from the people of the Sunnah we would accept and those people who are people of Bidah we would reject. So this term seems to have its um, origin as in this uh of Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah in both words way back in the earliest time. And obviously the term Sunnah and the Prophet saying to stick to his Sunnah and as the brother Yasser mentioned in a hadith with the Prophet describing the same sect that is the Jama'ah, you find it in the words of the Prophet Okay, so, and so, the, so the origin of this lies in the Sharia, the word Sunnah and the word Jama'ah. But in, used in, together in one word, Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah, probably Ibn Abbas or Ibn Sirin or in the early generations of Muslims at least. What, what did you say? Ahl Sunnah? Well, I'tilaf. I'tilaf means those people who, means like Jama'ah, means those people who have gathered, you know, and they have um, together, they have not. Uh, as opposed to ikhtilaf, which means that they have um, <laughs> Right, means that they have um, as opposed to uh, dividing themselves. Uh, <laughs> the this is a this is a difference of opinion thing as well. And I'll leave it to the scholars of hadith to point to us uh, the intent of the Syrian in this case. So we have the next definition, and inshallah this is the last definition. Then we come to the meat of the topic, inshallah. Asala. Uh, and usually we say asala for fire. Asala. Asala for fire. Uh, this term, a salaf or a salaf, salaf literally means those which preceded you. Anybody who came before you, from your forefathers or anybody, previous generations are called salaf. Over here, though, of course, we have a specific connotation, we have a specific meaning to it, and we mean those first three generations. The Prophet companion, those tabi'in, their successors or their followers, and the exile tabi'in, the third generation, uh, because these were the three generations which were specifically mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where he mentioned in the hadith of Bukhari, it's reported by Al-Imran bin Hussein, al Hussein and others, that the best of mankind was his generation, then that which came afterwards, and that which came afterwards. Some narrations add a fourth generation, and some uh, narrations uh, wording only have three generations. So, but generally three generations have been mentioned in this, in this hadith. So this is what we mean by Asalaf al so we mean the early generation of the Muslims, and also by extension, whoever follows them, 
Okay, even if he comes after the first three generations, because we know that the Sahaba, the last uh, Sahabi, died year 110, maybe, right? 110. Was the end of the generation of the Sahaba. Okay, now the the end of the generation of the Sahabain, I don't seem to recollect all time, but I know that the end of the Ekbar Sahabain is usually considered at the year 210. It's considered when the Ekbar Sahabain has entered, the third generation has entered, the last of them. According to the uh, the division of the scholars of Hadith and the Tabakat, the levels of narrators. Uh, we know, for instance, that Imam al-Shafi died in year 205. Okay? Um, Imam Ahmed ibn Hamra, who died in year 241. Bukhari died in 256. Okay? So you can see that these uh, men are not even really strong in the first three generations. I mean, I don't think even Imam al-Shafi is considered from the third generation. He's probably considered from the fourth generation. Imam Malik is considered from the third generation. Uh, from the Ittai Tabi'in. So obviously, can we now say that Imam al-Shafi'i or Imam al-Bukhari or Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal are not part of our Salaf and therefore their faces are not uh, acceptable? You know, we're only going to take those who come before two ten and that's it? No, obviously not. Because whoever adheres to that principle of those four three generations, even if he comes from the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generation, or even if he comes centuries later, like Ahmed ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Taymiyyah, right, who dies in the year 728, or uh, Ibn Abdul Wahab, for instance, who was, I think, in 1205. Uh, uh, these are all considered part of the Salaf in the sense that they all upheld that same principle. Abu Hanifa is 150. And he's from the lesser of the second generation. Not because he's, uh, don't misunderstand when I say lesser. <laughs> okay, <laughs> lesser. <laughs> now, in the sense that it's usually they divide uh, the succeeding generations after the Prophet's companions to those who saw a lot of the Prophet's companions, they call them as al kubra uh, or the major, and then those, and that would be like Ibn Musayyid, Sa'id ibn Musayyid. And those are then they're called al Wusra, the mid of that generation, and they're also called the Sughra or Sivar, and that's uh, the third. Uh, level. Because Abu Hanifa, uh, he only met three or four of the public companions, and therefore he's considered a sukkah. So what does he doesn't mean in the sense of his, uh, you know, our esteem for him, but in the sense that how many of the companions he has. So, uh, so uh, a sukkah of thought therefore means those first three generations, and anybody who adheres to that way, okay? And usually the appellation, uh, uh, we usually call them uh, a sukkah, Alright, or Salafi <coughs> with uh, I, okay, which is the Ya in Arabic, called Ya Nista. When you uh, are associated with something, you usually add this Ya to it, and you're therefore like that. So, for instance, if somebody is from Misr, he's called a Misri, okay, or a Shami, or a Mekhi, or something like that. And if he's from a certain tribe, he'd be called a Hashimi, <laughs> that's a good example. And, or Hashimi, that's better. And if he's also a certain sect, or if he adheres to a certain group of people, he will be called Hanafi or Hanbali in terms of the people who follow certain methods and sects. And likewise, in matters of belief, he will be called uh, like Shi'i or Mu'tazili or Khariji, performing the Shia and the Mu'tazili and the Khawarij. And also, if he adheres to the Salaf of Salaf, their understanding, he's called a Salafi. And just, just to uh, make matters clear, because there are a lot of people who seem to be confused these days. This term was used throughout the centuries. It's not something which a bunch of people made up this century. Okay, uh, recently. Some people imagine that certain scholars, you know, usually they attribute Sheikh al Albani, came up with this term and so forth. And unfortunately, this shows poor scholarship. If you look at uh, Imam al Zahabi, Imam al Zahabi, who died in the year 748. Okay, 748. And now in the year 1413. Uh, I missed the day, I missed the month, I didn't want to the year also. <laughs> well, it's almost 1414. In fact, I did that, uh, I think I went to New York about a month ago, and I gave a lecture to the 1414. So, uh, uh, Imam al in his, um, in a number of his works, he described certain scholars and called them that they were Salafi, and I'll give you an example. He described Ibn Salah, Ibn Salah has scholar hadith in his uh, work, Tazkirat al Hasab, calling him Salafi. And also he has a margin, uh, a, um, you might say an index or a concordance of his scholars who taught him, and he described some of them as being Salafi and Haqidah. 
And in his other work, um, Sira Alam al he describes somebody being Salafi in the line now, who he describes. But the point is that this term was used, as you can see, over 700 years ago, and even before that, was used by Salaf. There is no harm in this term, as long as we're trying to say that it is an adherence to a set of thoughts through two or three generations, right? And obviously it doesn't just mean just something to stay on your tongue. I mean, you have to adhere to it. Just like if you call yourself a Sunni, I mean, saying that you adhere to the Prophet and Sunnah, you should be adhering to the Prophet and Sunnah truthfully and not just by claiming something. So that's the third term. So, opposing this term, since we did uh, different terms before, we should have a term called and khalaf and something we call khalafi and this is usually a term oh, uh, this is a term which is used oh, excuse me khalaf this is a term which is used not in the linguistical sense over here meaning that if you're after a khalaf okay therefore we're al khalaf but this is a term of uh, a censure it's a term a disparaging term used to mean people who have uh, come later on and they have deviated from the belief of the Salaf. Although the Eshadis, uh, which is a deviated group in belief, they say that the knowledge, they say the people of the Khalaf were more knowledgeable and more wise than the people of the Salaf. Although the people of the Salaf were sound better off because they didn't speak about these topics that these Eshadis have invented or innovate. So the point is khalaf is usually used as a discouraging term. So don't consider yourself saying that I am from the khalaf and something like that because I'm not from the first three generations. You know, you shouldn't describe yourself that way. You can use the term attention. Okay. Okay, so now we have want to mention two hadith very quickly. And these two hadith form a foundation for our understanding of Ahadim and Jumaah. And there are many hadith on this subject. And I invite you to look at uh, volume one of um, Mishkat al Makabiyah and also volume three of Kitab al Sunnah, uh, Kitab al uh, Sunnah Abu Dawood, Kitab al Sunnah, you'll find some of these hadith. But the first hadith, of course, is a hadith which is in Bukhari where the Prophet said, I'll just mention it in brief, that there always remain a single group upon the truth. single group upon the truth. And the second hadith is the hadith that says the Ummah was right in 73 sects and they're all going to hell. So many people go to hell. And only one will be saved. And the saved group is, in one narration, he says, those who are upon what he is upon today and his companions. Okay. Those are two hadith in brief, and I think they're very long hadith. This is in Abu Dawood and elsewhere, and this is in Bukhari and elsewhere. Prophet Hassan said there will always remain a single group upon the truth. And then in that one narration said they will be manifest, they will be victorious. Upon those who go against them and upon those who quit or abandon them. And they will remain such until the day of judgment in one narration until the Messiah descends the second time, Ancient Maryam. And another narration says, until Allah decrees his matter, meaning that the first day of judgment. The second group is that, uh, second hadith, Prophet said that this nation would divide like previous nations divided. And in one narration, says, as the Jews divided into 71 sects, 70 of which went into hell, and only one was saved, and the Christians, 72 groups, 71 went to hell, and only one was saved, and he said that this Ummah would divide into 73 groups, all of which would and towards hell, except for one, and the Prophet and his companions being very um, interested in knowing which was the way of salvation, they said that the same group was that which he asked, Who are they? and looking at your side, replied that they are those who are from what he is upon today and his companions. So the point over here is the Prophet mentioning his companions provides the foundation or the proof that he said earlier that number the Jana'a means that those people who refer back to the understanding of the Salaf al Salaf and so forth. The Prophet didn't just say they are just following what he is upon. He said, and my companions were Ashabi. So the companions are the yardstick to understanding which the Prophet came with. 
Now let's think about this just from reason uh, prior to the proof of the Quran and Sunnah. We know the Prophet came with a message, with a revelation, right? And Allah in the Quran has described